Hi, I'm Debbie with Filmmaker in a Box, and welcome to FIB Online. What you're about to see is an excerpt from Filmmaker in a Box's first intensive case study on the micro-budget feature film, Two Million Stupid Women. Now don't be frightened by the title, it was actually written by a very smart woman named Amy Heidish, and is a very funny and fun film. Some of the points discussed in this excerpt refer specifically to the making of Two Million Stupid Women, but many of the points are non-specific enough to apply to nearly any production. If you'd like to know more about this intensive case study, and there are over 17 hours more of detailed behind-the-scenes information on all phases of development, production and post, visit filmmakerinabox.com. Once my resume ended up on the desk, I don't remember if it was a, a Mandy ad, a Craigslist, or something. Uh, I know that once my resume ended up on the desk, I know that Jason Crothers saw it and recognized it and said, I'd worked with that guy before and he was good. It was a totally new group of filmmakers for me. Uh, aside from, I didn't know that Jason was involved until later. And uh, so it was nice to see, you know, it's always nice to see a familiar face on the call sheet. You can only operate as fast as the flow of information that you're getting. Uh, and the information starts with the director who, you know, blocks the scene with the actors. Then from that blocking, the, the, uh, the DP and the director have their conversation on how they're going to cover it. And then from that information, is that's really when I start, when I get a chance to, to finally carve out a game plan for how uh, production sound is going to cover that scene. Um, because we have to work around those elements. And I kind of knew that, okay, averaging eight, nine, ten pages a day and shooting in some practical locations that there were going to be some things to watch out for. You know who should be talking to who. I know it should start with the director and get to the DP. The DP's going to, they're going to hash it out, hash out the blocking with the actors, and, and then the DP's going to, you know, eventually have his conversation with the gaffer about how they're going to light it, because I, you know, me as, as a production sound person, I have to work around all those elements, and you have to do it in a seamless kind of way. So, you know, there might be times where you're standing you know, where, where you thought was perfect, a perfect place for you to stand as a boom operator, you know, well, because of the shape of the room, the key light's got to go there and the flag's got to go here to keep it off this wall. And you understand that that's a photography consideration. And so you just have to figure out another way to do it, you know, and it's not personal. <laughs> they're not trying to, you know, they're not trying to, the DP's just not trying to, you know, screw you, but he is, you know, but he has, he's got to shoot the thing in, in the limited space that he has. And so... And that's why, you know, as a sound crew, you want to be flexible as to how, how many ways you can get the dialogue covered. I was using, you know, um, two labs and, uh, and a boom. You know, well, I'd, I'd have those coming into my mixer. And then, you know, from there, I'd have a headphone out that was going to, to me, to Pixie, and to the, uh, to the director, the scripty, and, you know, whoever else wanted to listen on a comm tech. Um, so that way they can kind of hear the, hear what's going on. And then uh, uh, I was recording all of those signals plus a mix signal in my internal recorder. And then uh, and then I was sending uh, my, my main outs were uh, routed to a Sennheiser uh, transmitter that was sending to a couple of receivers. Uh, I had one on each camera. And so I actually had, I think I had track one running to A camera and track two running to B camera, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and we might have gone hardline for some of that, where I was sending two tracks to one camera. A little Sennheiser uh, uh, receiver, very lightweight, battery powered. You know, a set of double A's in there would last most of the day. Uh, I'd, I'd change them out at like hour 10, and they were fine. Um, and, and that really helped. That helped our workflow a lot. The less cabling you have to do in a nine page day, the better. You need to wrap your brain around, you know, you need to wrap your brain around other things, like the logistics of covering, you know, these three, four, sometimes five characters in two cameras. You know, you have to wrap your brain around those logistics. And so I, I just chose not to. I didn't want to have Pixie uh, occupied running cables. You know, I needed her head with me so we could concentrate on how we're gonna, how we're gonna cover this stuff. And uh, so that it, it proved to be a good choice in the end. When you're shooting eight or nine pages a day, th this movie was a little different because they were wearing the same wardrobe the whole time. Um, on, on other movies, you know, it's sometimes access to the actor after they're in wardrobe 
is a little sliver of time. It's, it's, you know, they get dressed, they go into makeup, and then it's straight onto the set for a rehearsal. We have to kind of, you know, tug the AD's coattails and say, hey, we've got to put a lab on them. And, you know, when you're doing a lower budget movie where you're shooting a lot more pages, especially when they have the same outfits on all the time, we, um, we opted to kind of wait and see what the camera shot was. Because we knew uh, the two people that we could put labs on, we could put them on fairly quickly. And, but we, we wanted to see the blocking, and we wanted to see what the cameras were seeing before we pulled the trigger on uh, whether or not we had to put labs on them. And you know, we only put labs on if we had to. And if we, once we saw the shot, we would pretty much know between Pixie and I, we put our heads together, and we'd pretty much know, oh, we can get that, you know, because we were always set up to do two boom coverage. Most, uh, most two-person sound crews, you'll have a mixer working from a cart, and then you'll have a boom operator on set that's booming. We approached it a little differently. We had, a, uh, I was still on a bag rig. So at any given time, I could boom and mix, and Pixie could have a wireless second boom. She could cover another grouping of people, or she could cover the background, I could cover the foreground. So we were still, we could still function as boom operators and not lose the capability of mixing at the same time. And that's one of the things that I, I don't know that many mixers that do that. Uh, I know for this, for this particular production, it really saved us uh, because it left us that much more flexible to have two booms. Uh, and and as, soon as, we see, as soon as we see what the particular shot's going to be, then we, we pull the trigger on the labs if we need them. Um, but generally, uh, uh, you know, putting a lab on somebody, even though we could do it quick, you're still, you, you have to deal with an actor or an actress that's in there in their zone at that moment they're about to shoot a scene they're thinking about their lines they're thinking about their delivery and you know we we wanted to spare them them you know us having to get up in their business and put a microphone on them Mm -hmm. you know so um if we can leave it as smooth as possible for for them and for all you know for all the departments then we just we did it that way there's certain things that a lab will work with wardrobe wise uh and won't work with i'll use a rye coat over cover it's a it's like a little fuzzy thing that you can stick on top of it that keeps the shirt from rubbing directly against it, and uh, so and as long as the, as long as the blocking is not too physical, uh, where you have you know sometimes you know if you have people coming up to kiss each other, their bodies are going to touch or they're going to pet or do something. You you're done at that point. The challenge in lav miking was definitely on uh, Sarah, and she was wearing the the pink sequin party dress the whole time where we basically saw, you know we love to hide mics right here. You know, but we could see all of that the whole show. Mm-hmm. So uh, d- she was a challenge. And um, so we always, I know uh, Pixie, you know, my uh, my second and the sound crew, you know, we were always kind of on guard as to how we were going to cover her um, and and still be flexible with all the other processes going on on a set. Come here. Okay. okay. On my birthday. Okay. Hey, <laughs> we are here for no. margaritas. And not give me so much as a card. Katie, in contrast, was not nearly as loud as Sarah. So Katie, uh, and she had kind of a dainty outfit on as well. Uh, we didn't want to lav her unless it was totally necessary. And uh, But we did have some challenges in, in picking her up because she's a very soft-spoken person. It's very, uh, just the character itself that she was playing was, you know, a, a character that was seeking and it was very, uh, I don't know, she's a very self-conscious character. So she wasn't as boisterous and woohoo party as, as Sarah was. So uh, sonically, from a sound perspective, she's totally different. And uh, it, you know, having to mix all three of those sources, you know, in the same environment usually was it was a bit of a challenge. Mark was usually pretty easy to laugh. His wardrobe was button down polo is is pretty easy thing to laugh. Um, the type of mic that works best, it, we do what we call a button sneak, which is where you know the lav is hidden right behind a button, but it's actually sticking out in plain view. Uh, it's just behind the button. You'd have to see it if you were looking down on them. You could see a, an extra little circle in there. But most of the time, when they go close enough, you know, close up enough where you could see it, it's out of frame. Now here's the fun part. This is Transpor surgical tape. Now we get to tape the wire to his chest. Do you yeah, shave just... before? Uh... No, I don't need to. This takes it all off. And uh, the only problem with that mic is that it has no wind protection whatsoever. So once you get outside, you, in, any slightest, even the act of breathing, you can you pick that up sometimes. Mm-hmm. Uh, luckily, they can't breathe and talk at the same time. 
<laughs> so that's that gets us out of some trouble. But uh, <laughs> but um, and then for for other setups, there's a, a mic called the Sankin COS11, which is uh, what we put right under the shirt, which you wouldn't be able to see, but it has a really aggressive high end EQ curve on it, and with the right protection from the fabric noise, it really picks up nicely under a layer of clothing or two. You're thinking about the entire scene and you have kind of a checklist in your mind. Uh, you know, we already like, you know, obviously if cameras are going to see it, then we're going to cover it. Uh, but sometimes, you know, uh, it, the decision might be made by the director. Oh, we don't need to get a close up of this line. She's there in the background and we hear her. That's fine. You know, so that's those are the things that are important to us. Um, those are the situations where you'd be more likely to go to a lab or to go to a wild line or something like that. It just all depends on how the director sees it playing in the shot. You know, there's some, some things that are scripted as off screen where you know somebody said a certain line, but you hear it, but you're not going to see it. Mm -hmm. So we have to make sure that at some point we got that line right. clean. And uh, so in an essence, we're, we're our own little script supervisor, you know. <laughs> We check off everything we caught in a medium or a tight. I try to, I, I, when I have time, I like to write down what cameras were doing when we were shooting the scene. Uh, sometimes I don't have time to do that. Uh, you know, uh, the, the sound report is, you know, generally to let the, the audio editor or the video editor in that case, it kind of gives them a, a picture of what was going on, uh, you know, on the ground when we shot it. And, uh, you know, I, I realized that video editors now, uh, you know, as, with budgets getting smaller and the workflow getting more streamlined, I've noticed a lot more video editors are starting to do sound design as well. So any, the most, you know, the most information you can give them, the better. And, and that is, for me, is not just sound. That's for picture as well. Because there'll be some times when, you know, a B camera goes down to reload and they don't want to wait. So they'll roll it on A camera only. And so even in my slate at the head of, head of each take, I'll say A camera only or or you know I'll, I'll try to make note of that even though the slate the guy on the slate might say you know be camera only marker and clap it you know i'll, I'll still the more information that's out there for them later it's just the more clear of a picture they have when it comes to editing the scene yeah so it, it, all that information helps you know i like to try and put you know a camera's going tighter you know it, when we're moving that fast and sometimes we're even shooting in a series um where they'll grab multiple sizes in one take. You know, if you have a script supervisor, they may not have time to write all that down. And information is flying at such a fast pace, they may not have even heard or they may not have had a chance to write it down. So we, you know, it's just like the Department of Redundancy Department. You know, just write it down on the sound report. Even if it exists somewhere else, it doesn't matter. If I have two seconds to jot it down, then I'll do it. You know, it helps. Because I've, I've, I've sat in the editing chair and with no information whatsoever, and it's really difficult, you know. And you think you hear what you think you hear, but you're not sure. And that sound report is the thing that will clarify it for you. And that way you can, that way you know that, okay, in this scene, you know, the, the, the signals seem to change up a little bit. Well, you go to the sound report and go, oh, Sarah's lab is now on this track and not this track, because now she's the primary focus of the scene and not. So I tried to keep the primary focus of the track on track of the shot on track one because I knew that would get recorded with me and it would also get recorded directly to camera. So I know for for dailies for the people watching dailies later, they're, that's the sound that's on camera is what they're going to be using for a reference. And I wanted to make sure that yeah, whatever the primary focus of that shot ended up on channel one. Now that does leave a bit of a headache for the for the editor later because it's not like oh boom is always on track one. It's not like that. It changes for the editor. But that was, you know, that was a choice that I had to make early on. You know, knowing that anybody who's going to watch dailies, they need to know what they're hearing. There's some, there's some shows that actually have the budget and have the manpower in, in audio in the post side to sift through, you know, extra tracks and extra coverage. And, um, but what I've noticed on lower budget shows, you've really got to do as much for the next stage of the process as you can. Uh, because that will that will make their lives easier in post and, and you know and it's you know post is still expensive even on a lower budget project you know rooms cost money there's a lot of you know a lot of costs and uh, and if you can cut down what it costs for an editor to evaluate what you're sending them then that way they can flow right into their their next stage of production a lot easier 
for over 17 hours of additional videos and documents on all phases of the making of Two Million Stupid Women, visit filmmakerinabox.com. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe to FIV Online for more great videos.